Hi, I'm Miranda Cosgrove, and this is Mission Unstoppable. How does our brain decide what's real? Uh, what happened? This scientist knows. I wanted to know how the brain understands visual information. And meet an engineer navigating the future of self-driving tech. We add robotics autonomy to assistive machines like powered wheelchairs and robotic arms. Then Jackie Means makes an unusual breakfast. Plus, get ready for an explosive good time. Get ready to meet the scientists, inventors, and heroes who help make our world a better place. The future is here. The mission unstoppable. They say what you see is what you get, but that's not true. Whoever they are should have checked with Dr. Lace Padilla, who knows that sometimes our eyes betray us. Uh, Dr. Padilla? Hi, Nabil, welcome to campus. Uh, what happened? Did you drink a potion that said shrink me? No, no, it's just perception. Let me get a little closer. What? <laughs> How did you do that? Well, the way that this optical illusion works has to do with where your eyes are located. If you shift your eyes up, you'll see that these two parts of the chair are not even connected. The way that we perceive reality doesn't always match reality. Understanding why what we see isn't always what's real is why I came to see Dr. Lace Padilla, a cognitive scientist at the University of California, Merced. I have a master's degree in painting, and I always wanted to know, why do paintings make you feel a certain way? Or why do movies make you feel something? So I wanted to know how the brain understands visual information to help people make better decisions with that visual information. And I've been doing it ever since. Today, Dr. Padilla is showing me how studying perception can actually help save lives. And it starts with context clues and some crazy scary bunnies. Describe what you see. Two very scary bunnies in a dark hallway. One is bigger than the other, but beyond that, they look the exact same. What if I told you the two bunnies are actually the same size? What? How you do that? Because we have experience seeing things that are close up to us, much larger than things that are further away our mind fills in the information and will assume that this one is smaller, even though they are the same size. Correctly accessing the information we see isn't just for word games and bunny drawings. Dr. Padilla uses her expertise to improve important communication tools like hurricane forecasts. The one closest to you is called the cone of uncertainty. When most people look at this, they think it shows the size of the storm growing over time. I look at this and I think, the hurricane starts itty bitty and then gets larger and larger as it moves up. What it's intended to show is the uncertainty in the path of the storm growing over time. To help us understand uncertainty, Dr. Padilla has what's called a Galton board. There's a crazy bunny at the top with a predicted route to the house on the bottom. To simulate the bunny's path, Dr. Padilla takes a little bead and drops it into the board. Small pegs give the ball's path some uncertainty. The ball landed near the house, but how accurate was her forecast? This transparency shows a range of where she thinks the bunny could go. She's 67% confident that the bunny will end up somewhere in that range, which is exactly the same interval that's used in a real hurricane forecast. So what's with that number, 67%? They actually chose that kind of arbitrarily, which is really important for what I'm about to show you. This house out here, do you think it's safe or is it in danger? Our prediction says that it's not going to hit that house. Exactly. To test our prediction, we need more data. How safe is the house if we do 100 bunnies? That's a lot of bunnies. There are so many that have hit this house. Since traditional projection models can be misleading about what's safe, Dr. Padilla has created a new way to visualize uncertainty. Rather than showing a 67% confidence range, they show lines with possible paths the storm could take. The closer the lines are grouped, the more likely a hurricane is to follow that path. The circles represent the size, with colors representing the intensity. 
so it can communicate to you three things in one rather than misleading you about the size of the storm, which is what the cone does. This technique works for evil bunnies too, which I'm 67% sure aren't real. For centuries, wheelchairs have been, well, chairs with wheels. But with modern engineers like Dr. Brenna Argall at the wheel, these chairs are getting a high-tech makeover. Robots already help build our cars and clean our homes. They're starting to deliver our packages, bring us dinner, and even provide entertainment. But the next stage of the robotics and artificial intelligence revolution has the potential to do so much more. Unlocking that future will take the work of mechanical engineers, computer scientists, and roboticists. People like Dr. Brenna Argel, she does all three of those things and more. We now see computers everywhere, and it's sort of the next step that your computer now is doing something in the world. We call it actuating. You're actuating the world. You're, you're making it move. You're moving within it. For a machine to do that on its own or to do that in partnership with another human is just really, really interesting, really cool. Brenna runs a research laboratory at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab Rehabilitation Hospital in Chicago, where her team is designing the next generation of medical assistive devices. We add robotics autonomy, so think driverless car technology, to assistive machines like powered wheelchairs and robotic arms. And we do this in order to make operating assistive devices like these more accessible to people with very severe motor impairments. While many people with lower level spinal cord injuries can use a joystick to control their wheelchair, people with higher level injuries might only be able to control their machine via switches in the chair's headrests, or even breathing through a sip and puff interface. So Brenna's team has to take all of this into consideration when designing new technology. When we talk about robotics autonomy, we often say driverless cars, but for the technology we have in this chair, the better parallel is actually just the intelligence that we see in today's regular automobiles. We have things like lane assist, emergency braking, parallel parking. That kind of technology is what we want to bake into this machine. For people unable to operate a powered wheelchair reliably or safely, this technology could be a game changer. But even those who have mastered their chair's limited interfaces could benefit, as Brenna's about to demonstrate. So now I'm going to go down this ramp and start do taking the obstacle course, and I'm gonna be using this head array interface in order to drive the chair. So you can see if I tap my head backwards, I go forwards. And then if I wanna turn, I tap to the left. Now I'm gonna go forward, and I'm gonna to need to go around this obstacle. So I have to stop and turn, stop and turn. That's how this interface operates. Now Brenna engages the robotics autonomy and takes on the course a second time. So what you're gonna be able to see now is I'm just gonna drive forward. You'll see that I'm not turning my head to the left or the right, but the chair stops for me. And it actually drove me around as well. Now I need to give it a cue again that I want to go this way, it's giving a control signal to the left, but I didn't actually need to navigate that obstacle myself or stop myself. This autonomy intelligence framework is an autopilot. The chair is taking direction from the user, scanning the environment using 3D sensors and deciding how to get the driver where they want to be. Without the robotics autonomy engaged, even small tasks can take a lot of effort. So now I'm going to try to get through the door. But you can see here that I'm needing to tap, tap quite a bit. Even without having a motor impairment and the full use of my neck and shoulders, I find this pretty tiring. And now, Brenna will give the forward motion cues while the chair corrects itself. Here we go. So right now the chair is trying to find a safe path through the door. It found it and now it's turning left and right to get us through. You see how much easier that was that time. I didn't need to do any of this left-right tapping to align myself to navigate through that tight doorway squeeze. Different people want different amounts of assistance. They don't want a 100% autonomous driverless wheelchair. They want a shared control wheelchair. And getting that shared control sharing right is tough. It's actually where a lot of our research lies, is trying to figure out what is the right way to share control between the machine and the human. And we're really excited about the potential of that technology. What's better than a science experiment? A science 
egg experiment. Check it out. Today, I'm going to show you what happens when you combine acid and a calcium carbonate shell. I'm gonna make a bouncy egg by soaking it in vinegar. All you need to do this experiment is vinegar, a raw egg, and a container. The first step is to soak your egg in vinegar for between 12 to 48 hours. I soak this egg in vinegar for 36 hours. So I'm gonna gently pour my egg into a bowl of water so I can rub off this shell. Now I'm gently rubbing off the rest of the calcium carbonate shell that's been dissolved by the vinegar to reveal the membrane underneath. The acid in the vinegar removed our calcium carbonate shell from our egg, but it left behind a thin, semi-permeable membrane that surrounds the egg's insides. Now, in comparison to a normal raw egg, you can see this egg has expanded quite a lot. That's because water from the vinegar passed through this membrane, making it swell. The flow of water through a semi-permeable membrane like this is called osmosis. Ooh. This remarkable membrane is strong enough to keep the egg in one piece, yet flexible enough to give it that bounce when you drop it, as long as it's not from too high. And that's how you make a bouncy egg. But don't eat it, it's really gross. See you next time. I consider you all friends and would love to send you a little cardboard Miranda. But we're trying to be eco-conscious here, so they're just going out to my newest STEM besties. Bonjour, I'm Laura Gouillon. I'm an AR creator and filmmaker based in Paris, and I design and code augmented reality effects and videos. I studied computer science and immersive filmmaking at the University of Southern California. When I make AR effects, I start by coming up with an idea. Once I have a solid idea, then I design it. I build the effect, then the most exciting part is publishing it. Type A person, yes, absolutely. It all started for me in high school when I started learning 3D modeling and filmmaking and realized that I love being both technical and creative at the same time. With AR, I can make experiences that are larger than life, like big red boots, x-ray sunglasses, and even my very own sidekick, 3D Laura. I'm so excited to have my STEM bestie, Miranda, on the journey with me. She's right behind me, isn't she? Not all explosions are science. Actually, I guess they kind of are. But we really had to mine this next story to find one that's extra science-y. Check it out. This landscape might look like a moonscape, but it's really a huge quarry in Southern California filled with a lot of potential. Up ahead is Allison Everhart. She's a geologist and environmental manager for Cal Portland, a construction materials company. I was the kid that was always playing with different rocks and minerals. I actually had a diary that had the chemical compositions of a bunch of different minerals. Now Allison gets to oversee mining operations from start to finish. So today we are going to be blasting for limestone. Oh wow, is it all that surrounds us here? Yes, this whole quarry is full of it. And this is, looks amazing, but why do we even need limestone? Limestone is used to make cement, which is the main ingredient in concrete. Oh. And concrete is the second most used material. So we're gonna drill the hole, and then after that we can go down and load the ampho in the hole, which is ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. Oh man, this sounds so cool. If you're ready, I'm ready to rock. Let's roll. <laughs> There's a lot of science behind a mining explosion. First, the blast pattern is mapped out by a computer. It also determines the size of the holes a giant drill makes for the explosives and how much rock will be displaced. Now what? Now we're going to prime the holes. So okay. we're going to take this blasting cap and Great. there is a primer right here on the end. Are we fishing for something? No, actually we're gonna make this thing explode. <gasps> okay, great. Yes. I'm ready, I'm excited. After Allison feeds the primer into the booster, I help lower it into a hole 42 feet deep. Oh my gosh, fire in the hole in later, hopefully. Yes. This cord is going to carry the electric charge that will oh. um, spark the booster and explode the info. Great. Gonna take this rock and wrap it around. Looks safe, looks stable. Put it there. 
Dunzo? Yes. The next step is a crucial one. Alice and Bob's a weighted tape measuring 15 feet into the hole, while I guide a snorkel from a bulk truck as it dumps the Anflow explosive up to the measured depth. That's it, I did it! Oh, that was the most important part, right? Yes. It's almost big blast time. A bobcat comes through to fill the hole with rocks as we head off to a safe distance. So do you want me to be a part of this or is that like dangerous? I'm gonna need your help for safety reasons. Okay, cool. So as I let off the detonator, mm -hmm. I am going to have you <gasps> talk into this radio. Yeah. You're gonna be in charge of counting down the five, four, three, two, one, and then your loudest fire in the hole. That's you ready? That's the coolest part, yes. Five, four, three, two, one. Feels like an earthquake. That's wild. Oh, absolutely. Wow. That's what 12,000 pounds of explosives will do. Are you guys hiring? Talk to me after this. After they all clear, I learned how to test a rock to confirm if it is in fact limestone by dropping a tiny amount of hydrochloric acid on it. After putting on some safety gloves, of course. Go ahead and drip it right here. Ooh, I'm scared. So how will I know this is limestone? What should happen? It will fizz very violently. Okay, ooh, very violently, nice. All right, here we go. <gasps> ooh, it is happening, wow! We've struck limestone! Yes! Oh man, it's not science without some fizz. After grabbing some sample rocks, we head to the lab. Oh wow, cool! This is the lab? Yes, this is our last step today where my job ends and the chemist job begins. Oh wow, so what happens to these? So now they are going to analyze the chemical composition of these rocks for quality control purposes. Today has been so awesome. The explosion was amazing and there's so much science involved today that I had no idea about. I'm not really gonna take anything I learned today for granted. Thank you so much. Of course. Welcome back. Before we go, we have one last thing. One piece of advice I have for the younger generation wanting to get into STEM careers, once you find your passion, chase it fearlessly, regardless of what others say. As I was growing up, many people doubted me. They said I would have to act or look a certain way to be successful in a STEM career. And I told them differently. I like to have my nails done, do my makeup and my hair, and I still come to work every day and get the job done. There's no secret sauce, there's no easy path. You just have to work hard every day. And if you're willing to show up and stick with it, you will absolutely have a career in STEM. Just kind of, you know, hunker down and, and go for it. You'll find good people who are supportive. Just go for it. And that's it for this week's episode of Mission Unstoppable. We're trying to book some worms for next week, but they keep on wiggling out of it. Bye! If you're watching this, you must have really liked the video. Make sure you follow and subscribe and check out these other videos that are even better. No, really, I've seen this one over a hundred times.